Well, hello and welcome to this session. This is Understanding Sage CRM Performance. It's um, a short training session uh, aimed at support colleagues and partners who are um, want to be able to understand how um, Sage CRM's performance is affected by different factors. Um, we're going to be uh, looking at a wide variety of different uh, topics within this session, but we do have always the place where we need to go. We're always the place where we need to look at in order to make sure that we've got uh, the information that we need to understand CRM, and that's the resources and documentation that's available. Always make sure that you know about help.sagecrm, Make sure that you're telling your colleagues, make sure you're telling partners and customers about help.sagecrm.com. Uh, the information is up to date. Uh, you see everything on here from the, the uh, support lifecycle through to the help and guides for all of the currently supported versions of uh, Sage CRM. And we're currently on, uh, when I'm recording this, is Sage 2020 R1. Another important source of information is going to be uh, the YouTube channel. That's the that's the Sage Customer Support and Training YouTube channel. Uh, we've got a few videos that explicitly cover uh, performance, but uh, all of the other topics within this that I'll be talking about are actually expanded in different videos there. So if I talk about, for example, workflow uh, tuning, uh, if I talk about um, uh, the idea of system architecture and the importance of uh, the specification for a machine, then you'll find that there are videos on here. And of course, after today, uh, there'll be an additional um, little lesson about system performance. So what we're looking at uh, in this uh, short uh, training session is different aspects of system performance. And we can identify these as really factors to do with the architecture itself, the reality of Sage CRM as a piece of software. So what's its design? How does its design imply certain um, areas that are going to be the question marks for us when we're investigating a performance issue. Then you have general system environment uh, issues. So where we sit with a, a system that that is a, a, a th you know a threefold um, architecture where you have both the database layer and application layer, uh, which includes the uh, concept that we're in a transport layer of of uh, of the network, and then we also have a presentation layer of what might be going on inside the client machine. And then you also have uh, areas around where the system is generally configured. What are the choices that are being made uh, when we uh, choose certain settings? And these are these are general settings that a system administrator can make to uh, make sure that we're not doing un any, any unnecessary tasks that impact system performance. We also then have the choices that users can make themselves. And by users, I mean the business. So are there any patterns or behavior that actually are self-defeating about the way in which people log on, where they uh, use the system, which um, actually does not allow um, the best behavior to be uh, driven from within the, the software? And then we also have some choices that can be made when we're extending the system. This is not such a big topic within uh, what I want to talk about today, but they are nevertheless things that we need to um, uh, need need to be included. Um, right. So let's start with system architecture. What are the choices that we we make here? Um, and with system performance. Uh, with system performance, uh, system architecture, we, we have the reality that what we're looking at is something that is uh, a hybrid architecture. We can. Th this is something that I talk about very frequently in any of the presentations that I give. We uh, are working with software which um, works with uh, two separate web servers. The fact that, that all of the requests come in 
from uh, the the REST clients, the S data consumers, from the browser, through uh, a firewall onto IIS, uh, then it's redirected off, depending on where it is, either into uh, the IS API extension, which is the eWeb DLL, the main user interface, or whether it goes off and is redirected in requests to uh, Apache Tomcat. Whatever we're doing, ultimately those database, uh, uh, those those web apps and the eWare DLL, which is responsible for the generation of the the user interface for the um, for the maintenance of the of the uh, an application of the business rules within the system. Ultimately, they're going through to the database, either a connection through JDBC or a connection through to uh, ADO to the database and that database is responsible both for delivering the the metadata which describes the system and also the application data that uh, obviously the user is interested in and the choices that we make ultimately go down to how do we uh, interact with uh, the database. So you can see here that there are a number of different um, bottlenecks or at least contention points where there may be uh, areas of investigation for any system performance questions. We exist within an environment that uh, is complex and there may actually be things that are well beyond the immediate system of the database and the application server. We may be having to think about uh, issues about the network performance and we may also be having, having to think about uh, things like um, uh, issues around proxy servers or even the uh, VPN that may actually be uh, creating drags into the system, um, into the experience of the user. And as we look at all this, I, I, it's it's a interesting concept in the sense that I personally don't believe that there is anything um, called, uh, you know, a performance problem. There's only a perceived performance problem. There's not. You can't actually say that this is a problem until somebody experiences it as a problem. And as we look at an important area of CRM, which is metadata, the, the, the interface of Sage CRM is really, really big. You know, you've got um, you, you've got a uh, an environment that uh, is um, complex screens with workflow with uh, different um, areas drawn from different database tables all combined and as you're working through the system you're also looking at system prompts uh, controls over those and that's the job of the metadata now CRM is designed in itself to be very efficient so as metadata is needed that's when it's called up but um, we understand that really what is the, the the key area for anything within Sage CRM is going to be the database. The database is, if you like, the, the chief bind on the experience of the user. And that includes not only the application data, but as you can see here, the question about metadata as well. Okay, so we've started to understand that um, we've got uh, an application architecture which starts to identify clear areas where we can investigate but when we come to the specific environment and how that's implemented well here we have some choices that can be made we have our environment um the sage crm exists in a complex environment we uh, work with integrated systems and and i'm not going here to think about explicitly the integration with sage accounting systems and bms systems um but we have sage crm nevertheless interacting with different services uh, like uh, exchange and office 365 like with mailchimp um and we'll we will touch on some of the choices around the networking here that we we need to make but probably the the uh, area that we need to consider most clearly is 
are we meeting the hardware requirements and environmental requirements uh, for our system? And we've got, if we think about where we are within uh, SageCR, and we've got a database, it's HCRM is installed on SQL Server, it's a relational database. Um, we have a choice uh, around the specifications for the database server. We may also have uh, choices to be made around the application server if we if we are needing to separate the two into different servers, but they each have their own requirements. And then we also have some uh, then choices to be made uh, about scaling and how that's approached. And it's important when we are planning our system that we do this thinking in terms of not only um, honestly what what our system usage is, and, and we've got lots of different uh, users who are working with small numbers of users. For example, the, the, the typical uh, typical size of uh, a Sage CRM initial installation is between 9 and 11. They tend to grow over the years uh, as more users are, are added into the system. Uh, into a particular implementation, but um, it might be that uh, in some users where there's only three or four users, then you could actually be finding you can get away with using SQL Express. But as soon as you start to increase the number of users, then your demand on the system is going to be much greater, but not all users are equal. So you've got uh, the consideration that people who are making intensive calls and updating of those uh, co those communications are actually going to be more intensive users of of Sage CRM and therefore the database than say a sales user who's on the road and is making casual inquiries two or three or four times a day on who they need to see and the information that they need to use. But somebody who's in a call center environment is a much more intensive user than a um, uh, than a s standard sales user or even um, somebody who is a marketing user, perhaps. Marketing users have their own uh, particular uh, usage profile because, of course, the, the types of work that they're going to be doing, and I'll mention that a little bit later on. But when we're thinking about usage, um, we also have to think in terms of invisible users, um, the invisible users are those who aren't really, uh, they're, they're not people who are, they're not people or users in the way that um, that you and I would consider that, but they are rather the internal operations of uh, Sage CRM. And I think I've got uh, some considerations of this uh, in one of the slides. Let me go back, I think, into here. Um, you, you, if we look on this slide again, which is uh, the slide showing the services within the hybrid architecture, we've got things like the mail manager, like the escalation service, like the indexing server and the quick find, which are all placing a load on the system. They're all doing tasks. They're all generating out um, uh, SQL uh, transactions, and that's all placing. They act as though uh, they are a user themselves, constantly running within the system. So if I think just in terms of that um, uh, question about the, the users, include those processes almost as a user as well as we start to think about um, uh, the, the work that we're doing within the system. Some systems are completely different. You've got some companies which uh, really can be a multi-million pound company and still get away with using small numbers of CRM users and still uh, small numbers of, or, or, for example, a small uh, accounting system like a Sage 50 environment um, because that's the nature of their work. They have relatively simple uh, in-out operations. Others are very um, complex and messy when it comes to the amount of data that is being interacted with in the system. That's the uh, usage profile of that particular business. We can scale 
And uh, when we scale, we are going to be thinking in terms of uh, how we split the number of application servers, because that's one of the uh, congestion points as uh, users uh, contest to access the system. So from a load balancing perspective, we can add in application servers and the documentation talks about that process. And we can actually be very, very clever in the way in which we apportion uh, the uh, the the division of different multiple servers so we can uh, balance out the load not just in the transactions that come into the web server requesting uh, items but we can actually uh, indicate that certain services like the the advanced mail manager will sit on one server uh, the escalation server will sit on another and the indexing server and quick find will sit on yet another and when we can also drive for example then the integration with um, exchange from one of those servers as well. So we've got um, ways in which we can scale and, and that's actually something to, to investigate and look up with inside the, the uh, documentation. Probably um, when we're working uh, in the area of um, uh, the the database as well and this is really much focused on the question about uh, our our database environment and um, right not so much the multi-server environment but the question of with, with the database is are we working within an area that that is properly tuned. If we think about the number of users that are hitting the system, they are going to, in one system, they are going to be uh, looking and interesting in areas that are different from another uh, implementation. So um, we might actually be, uh, one organization might be very intensive on the, uh, say, uh, the opportunities table and within the communications table, and another might actually be doing far more interrogations of, for example, the case table and library. And there may be more differences in the patterns of how they're using the system and rather than the different where they're using the system. So they could be doing far more in out actions. That's the create the updates and deletes rather than simply read actions. The choices that we make. In terms of usage indicate the way in which the database is going to be used and consequently we would need to uh, consider using tools like the uh, the SQL Server Tuning Advisor to be able to identify whether or not uh, the workflow that we are in, in imposing on the database is uh, correctly um, reflected within the indexes of the system. So are the indexes appropriate within the database for the usage that we're putting uh, the system? So we collect that using the SQL profiler. We can then analyze that to see how our users do this, and then we can update the indexes appropriately. Uh, but this, by the way, is not a magic wand. This is something that if you have an immediate as uh, if, if, a, if a customer or a site is experiencing sudden um, uh, issues about uh, user experience and performance, this is not something that you wave a magic wand and do this. This may take a few days in order to collect the appropriate amount of um, SQL work. And, and why do I say a pro number of days? Well, if you think about the if you think about the usage of a system, it's going to differ within the day itself. So there's a diurnal pattern and then there is a weekly pattern of usage uh, of a system as people approach this. Then you'll have questions about month end and then you'll also have questions about uh, year end as well or quarter end. So these are all all questions about how we collect the appropriate SQL information in order to carry out uh, indexing uh, tuning. But our environment is nonetheless, whatever we're doing, it is uh, essentially resting on the interaction through to the database. And um, I don't think I can stress that uh, enough as to whatever modules you're using, 
ultimately you're going down into the database uh, and that needs to be um, that's the main contention point for Sage CRM. But let's look at ways in which the system administrator can make improvements to uh, the system uh, through configuration choices that they make. The first is that uh, we can create an artificial anchor, a drag for ourselves by unnecessarily logging within the system. If we think about what logging is, it's writing uh, entries into a file and any file system in out rewrite operations are going to be more intensive than than say the equivalent uh, database interaction so if we can turn off logging and uh, making sure that system logging is set to uh, either off or to a minimum then we can um, improve that experience we'll, we'll just take away the, the fact that we're writing any system logs out um, we can also help ourselves when it comes to escalation rules. Uh, escalation rules, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> escalation behaviour uh, is something that is driven within the interface by the very fact that users are logged on into the system, but there is also the escalation service, which runs um, continually. But if we're considering performance, we need to uh, think about the user experience first and foremost, and this is the behavior that is driven to cause uh, on-screen alerts uh, to a user and to trigger behavior uh, perhaps as a user is working within the system and this is where there may be actually uh, automatically uh, data changes triggered by whatever a user does now we've got uh, some tuning a very important tuning option that we can make here around escalation and this is uh, if you consider the choices of immediate delivery versus system performance, the default in uh, the the system as you put it in uh, into a vanilla system is actually for immediate delivery. And this means that, uh, for example, if somebody updates an opportunity um, as they click the save button, that's when the escalation rules associated with that update of the opportunity are going to be checked. And that means that there would therefore be a drag with for the user as additional checks are made out. And that would not just affect that user, but also potentially other users uh, of the system as well, as there is a momentary pause as a thread is run within the database to check uh, the work that needs to be done. And but if we leave it to system performance, it means it's aggregated to the to the tuning as to whatever you want within the system notification. So here you can see the system no interval is at five minutes. Uh, that, by the way, is the minimum interval for uh, the um, uh, escalation service. But in terms of if somebody's working in the system for those users who are um, are working in the system you've got the you can change the notification interval so it's every 10 minutes for example rather than every at uh, five minutes you can also change individual rules so if you have um, particular escalation rules if you're investigating them and you find that individual escalation rules are taking um, some time to execute or they themselves cause um, a a, a noticeable duration uh, in the logs, those escalation rules themselves could be changed so that they don't run every five minutes. So maybe they only need to run once a day. So you can change those and tune those in the individual escalation rules themselves so that they only run when they absolutely necessarily need to run. There are some other choices that users can make to um, help themselves in the way in which uh, the system uh, is experienced and performance can be uh, improved. The, the system usage is really not necessarily something that the an individual user 
uh, needs to think about. Rather, it is something that a system administrator can make on their behalf, working with the business analyst to understand how a business needs to operate in order to carry out tasks. And some tasks, and you can understand this, some tasks are intensely um, uh, intensely the SQL uh, using. So you've got things like um, uh, reporting, you've got things like um, group exports to uh, to a spreadsheet, you've got uh, group exports or imports uh, to MailChimp, you've got, you've actually got mail merge itself. These are all going to be working with uh, large sets of data and you can you may want to work with the different teams to understand when they need to carry out certain tasks so that they can take place uh, within a window of operation. And you can even do things, there are little tricks that you can do. If you have a look on the on the uh, Sage City community, you'll see that there are discussions about how you can even turn off certain uh, category areas until um, uh, and make them only available within a certain time time frame. So you can actually, for example, it might be that uh, the marketing reports aren't available until um, uh, an, until a certain time of day. Time of day. So you can actually be a little bit cunning in what you do. But if we think about uh, the operations, uh, imagine you're a sales. Uh, or a marketing user and you're wanting to drive out a bulk mail merge. The individual mail merge themselves ha are noticeable in terms of the uh, in um, in terms of the SQL transaction that is made because you have to um, uh, and and the operation that has to be made. You have to retrieve uh, the template. You have to retrieve the data. You have to uh, and and in the case of an HTML template, you are retrieving it from the database as well. And then you are carrying out a server operation in order to carry out the merge and that merge um, has a number of factors affecting it so the things that uh, certainly are if you like the depressive uh, factors are the number of records that are being used the type of template that has to be loaded into memory uh, are you working with for example a word document or an html document are you working with um, uh, and word, word documents are a little bit more intensive than html documents um, and if you're working again with uh, a type of merge which is a nested merge, that's going to be a little bit more intensive as well uh, versus the machine itself. Um, have you got the right processor? Have you got the right memory? And this is all to do with the hardware factors that we, we discussed earlier. And this is, this is old information. This is now uh, eight years old information, but this is the type of factors that you can start to see in um, the performance of mail merge. So it, it, it starts to uh, ramp up in terms of the tasks. And so if something is, if you're mail, carrying out a mail merge of 2,500 company records, you're, that's going to take some time. So that's an experience that uh, you may want to try and segregate those activities to a time that is, that that nobody else is uh, using the system. Otherwise, you will get that sense of I, I'm experiencing a system drag and you want to be able to try and make sure that um, one user's choices are not impacting negatively the experience of other users within the system. Another uh, area that uh, actually you can, this is to do with fine tuning um, the experience of a user is imagine the the the, the nine o'clock rush as you've got lots of different users arriving in and turning on so within a short period of time uh, you you've got people um, maybe choosing to access sage crm and uh, lots of intensive sql operations are going on so i would make sure that your choices in terms of preferences um actually narrow this down to avoid certain uh, certain things. So, for example, if you're finding that uh, everyone is using um, 
the dashboard or they're using the calendar. Those are two areas of the system that are very SQL intensive. You're retrieving a lot of information. At the calendar itself, you, you could have thousands of, of uh uh, hundreds of uh, communication records that might need to be dropped into a calendar. You've got tasks, you've got the appointments uh, that people may have, regular appointments, um, the, the the everyday tasks that people have been scheduled. And, and you might not need to look at that straight away. So log on to something else, and then when the user wants to do it, they can switch into that. And again, the dashboard, if that dashboard contains um, very in, not only lists, but also reports uh, for their for their control panel, this is another area that you may not want to immediately have people log on to um, if you're going to preserve a little bit of um, or, or try and tune the experience of system performance. So these are all little tactical things that we can do. Uh, and so we've looked at four of the different five areas that I wanted to cover in, in today's session. And the last one is going to be system extension. This is probably the, the area that is the, the, the easiest to, to handle because it's implicit in the role of the developer to, to think in terms of how is my uh, how are the choices that I'm making going to impact on the experience of the user? And it is important that we are designing things um, for performance in, in terms of uh, the uh, the scripts that we may have chosen uh, that are loading in, the way in which we have written the ASP pages, the .NET and the web services. Um, we can make choices that are inappropriate. Uh, we can make choices that uh, that rely on, for example, um, uh, techniques that 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 actually are not best practice. They are they're not you can write code, for example, that um, doesn't make best use of looping. So you're instantiating objects within loops that shouldn't be instantiated. You are um, you, you are making repeated sql uh re retrievals when when you when actually you don't need to it could have been done with a single um query um and that depends again on the types of views that are available which in turn from a performance perspective goes back to the indexing that you might have within the system and when we come on to the design there are two probable areas that i i think that 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 when it comes to especially working with um, now when such CRM is deployed within the cloud environment, when we are working uh, with systems that are very complex and disparate, then we we need to think in terms of the design for uh, of our applications around SOAP. Um, so the SOAP web service is a particularly um, important area to think in terms of choices uh, this is because you've got different ways of requesting data and um, any api choice that you make whether you're dealing with the rest api or the soap um, web services will result in a sql query and um, we'll see in a moment that the that the rest api is far more obvious as to what you're doing. But if you're using, for example, the SOAP web service and you're making a, a, a request to uh, retrieve data, you've got about four different methods you can use. And one method, if you're interested only in, uh, for example, um, the information from the company, you want to retrieve the company and the company name and the company um, ID, then you would use a fine, you would use a record, a get record method rather than using a get entity record. Choosing get entity, for example, within the SOAP uh, API would result in not only retrieving the company information, but the person information, the address information. Uh, the phone and the email information, information that you do not need for that particular question. So the choice that you make 
in terms of the API has to be thought in terms of the expense of SQL uh, and database interaction. It's a little bit easier within the REST API uh, because there the, the type of resource that you're uh, accessing um, t can include resources that uh, are uh, simply views uh, and or simply the entity without necessarily retrieving any child information from within that. So your uh, the load that you make when you retrieve using the, the REST API uh, is by design really of the API a little bit more uh, performant. Now, I think I've just about wrapped up what um, I wanted to talk about. We've looked at these, these different areas. We, we looked at five areas of uh, the system uh, that, or five aspects of, this, of, of an implementation of Sage CRM that can control the user's experience of, um, of the whole system. So I would um, hope that that's been of use to you.